<clears throat> so what we're going to do this morning is discuss the world of Tohu. That's a primordial creation, which I'll explain in a minute. The tree of knowledge. The sin of the tree of knowledge, primarily. And the concept of a moral compass. Now, Some of the, um, the concepts over here are really very, very intimately interlinked. And you could say they laid one on top of the other. They're inter, um, interlayered, <coughs> you could say. What I mean by that is, <coughs> there's a concept in, in Kabbalah, <coughs> which is spoken about in the Sefer Yetzirah, in the Book of Formation, <coughs> which is called Olam, Shana, and Nefesh. Olam, Shana, and Nefesh, meaning existence, physical existence, or sometimes translated as world or space, time, and being, or soul. So space, time, and soul, three interlinked, uh, and soul, three interlinked, uh, interlinked or overlaid concepts. The deepest one being soul, then on top of that are uh, overlaid space and time. The most external is time, the most internal is soul. Now that's the way it usually goes, actually, if we would uh, talk about this in terms of the Sfirot, in terms of the divine emanations, <coughs> the Sfirot, so space is essentially defined by the six Svirot of Zeir Anpin. Of Zeir Anpin. In other words, the Svirot from Chesed through Yesod. Chesed, Gvura, Tiferet, Netzach, Chod, and Yesod define space, the six sides of space, up, down, right, left, front, back. The six sides of space. Whereas time is defined by Malchus, the Sphere of Malchut. Hashem Melech, Hashem Malach, Hashem Yimloch. God ruled, does rule, and will rule. That's the idea of time. Was, is, and will be, is the idea of Malchut. It's part of Malchut. <coughs> so the most external one is really, although it may not seem like it, the most external one, or the one closest to us, put it that way, closest to the surface, is really time. Space is a more internalized concept. And then soul is obviously the being, the, the living being of the thing, in any event. All of these three have parallel structures or parallel events. A thing that happens in one of them happens in all of them. If an event happens in time, it also affects space and it affects soul. If it happens in soul, it affects space and time and so on and so forth. So all of these things are really parallel concepts, parallel ideas. And um, as a result of that, in order to be able to understand one thing, we sometimes have to understand one of the others in order to explain it. This is actually a basic principle of Hasidic philosophy and then the philosophy and teachings of the Baal Shem Tov and his successors. That in order to understand, um, in order to understand one thing, in creation, for example, in time and space, so it is necessary to understand something in soul in ourselves. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to explain a primordial, a primordial event, which is called the shattering of the vessels of the world of Tohu, by a certain internal human personality events and structures. <coughs> now, why do we do that? Uh, because since we're closest to ourselves, we can understand these events in terms of things that happen with us ourselves. The more internalized something is, the better we are able to understand it. So, let's just begin uh, with the explanation of the um, 
verses, which I started off with. I'm going to switch now to a document. As you can see, <coughs> the first verse comes from the, from the um, from Genesis. I didn't have time, unfortunately, to translate them all into English before the class, but um, we'll do so as we go along. So. If anyone wants, I can just send them the document, and you can um, you can um, put the translations in at some time. Just let me know at the end of the class, or just send me an email, and I will send you this document if you want the original sources. Okay, so <clears throat> the first verse is like this. It's actually the second verse in the Torah. The first verse in the Torah talks about in the beginning God created heavens and earth, and then it says Vaharetz the earth. Now, when it says Aretz, the earth, it doesn't mean necessarily only the earth. It means physical being, physical reality. The land or the earth or physical reality was in a state of chaos that should not be wasted. It would be chaos is a better word. I don't know why I translated it like that, but I did. Uh, let's just see. Chaos. Chaos. Chaos and void and voidness. I don't know if you can say voidness, but anyway, it was, uh, was, 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 uh, the earth was chaos and a void, I guess you would say, yeah? And a void and darkness is upon the deep. Now, <clears throat> Kabbalistic works explain that the world of Tohu was a primordial creation that was created in order to be destroyed and destroyed in order to be restructured or recreated. It was created in order to be destroyed and destroyed in order to be recreated. Now, what do we mean by this? <clears throat> so they explain, the Kabbalistic works explain, that this world of Tohu uh, was inherently unstable, was created in an unstable way so that it shattered. And then it is our, it's the duty of mankind to put it back together, but in such a way that it is now, it will now be a stable world. In other words, to reconstruct the world of Tohu or to do what is called the work of Tikkun. Tikkun, Tikkun is rectification. So our purpose, therefore, is to restructure the broken shards, if you want to call them that, of the vessels of the world of Tohu, reconstruct them, and then the light of the world of Tohu, which was retracted when the world broke, because every world is comprised of lights and vessels, orot and kelim. When the kelim, when the vessel shattered, so the subsequent um, um, what, what happened what happened was then that the, the the lights returned to their original source, but when the vessels are rebuilt, the lights will be able to be drawn down again, but in a stable way, and they won't shatter the vessels anymore. That's why it says that the earth, in other words, the creation, this initial initial creation called. Tohu was chaos. It was in a state of chaos, tohu, and void. And darkness was upon the deep. Darkness, because there was no direction, there was no illumination. The illumination was retracted. But illumination, and this is a very important point to note, is a visual concept. Darkness and light are visual concepts. They're not ordeal or any other kind of concept. There are visual concepts and this is critical in understanding what the world of Tohu is all about. Now, the Arizal Rabbi Yitzhak Luria, the famous Kabbalist, the father of modern Kabbalah, <coughs> lived in Safed in Sfat in the 1500s. Um, he wrote in uh, Eitz Chaim, Actually, let's be more precise. It's not that he wrote it. His chief disciple wrote down his teachings. The chief disciple's name was Rabbi Chaim Vital. So he wrote in Eitz Chaim from the teachings of his master the following about the world of Tohu. 
He says, this is the secret of the verse, the earth was waste and void. We want to change that to chaos. Uh, chaos. Yeah, chaos and void. And he goes on to say, and this is the aspect of the eye. This is the aspect of the eye, which is Tohu and the death of the primordial kings. Now, I don't want to go into all the details over here, but I will explain as follows. As uh, everybody knows, there are five planes of reality. Five planes of reality. The highest plane of reality is the world called Adam Kadmon. That is followed by the world of Atsilut, and I'll explain this uh, in, um, in, uh, in a bit more detail in a minute. Then the world of Berea, and then the world of Yetzira. Up. And then comes the world of Asiya. Okay. Now, let me just explain these over here. The world of Adam Kadmon is this primordial, it's a primordial creation even preceding the world of Tohu. <coughs> the world of Tohu is said to be a certain aspect of the light that comes out of Adam Kadmon. The world of Atsilut, this is the world of Tikkun. Um, why I did that, I don't know, but I'm sort of typing in two different modes over here, which is probably the reason, but... All right, so the world of Tikkun Atsilut is what repairs the world of Tohu. From Ark really came Tohu. And then Tohu smashed, and then Tikkun uh, needed to be repaired. Right, Tohu needs to be repaired, and the, and the reparation or the, the repairing of the world of Tohu is from Atsilus. Right? Okay, so. Um, yeah, all right. Now, to be more precise, the world of Tohu is one of the lights, as I said before, that came out of the world of Adam Kadmon, which is usually trans translated as, as usually just written as Ak, Adam Kadmon Ak. The literal translation, primordial man, it's not that there was a man that was primordial, it was just that it was in the image of the divine, and therefore it's called primordial man, Adam Kadmon, the prior form of what man is all about. And since man's source is essentially in Ak, the root, 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 root of his soul is in the world of Adam Kadmon, therefore it's called Adam Kadmon. Okay, now, <clears throat> the light that came out of the world of, uh, the, out of the, um, uh, out of Ark, there were actually several different types of light that came out of the world called Adam Kadmon. Now, <clears throat> One of those lights is called the light of the eyes. The light that comes, there's light that comes out of the eyes, out of the nose, out of the mouth, out of the, out of the ears. The light that comes out of the mouth is the light of Tikkun. The light that comes out of the eyes is the light of Tohu. And this is where the shattering was according to the Arizal. And the death of the primordial kings means the breaking of the vessels of the world of Tohu, as is explained at the end of Parashat Vayishlach in um, the Arizal's explanation of the verses of the Torah. In any event, what does this all mean, the breaking of the light of the eyes? So in order to be able to explain that, uh, we have to go a little bit further and explain some other things. Um, there's a question first of all from Eric. Uh, good morning, Eric. How are you? <laughs> um, the light was retracted. The sparks were brought down, fell with the vessels. The light, the sparks fell with the vessels. And that's really, that's what we're talking about. That's what has to be uplifted and, 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 and restored. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, <clears throat> hopefully. Okay, now, 
That is all about the world of Tohu. Let's now talk for a minute about the world, about the, um, the Garden of Eden, and primarily the Eitz Hadas, the Eitz Hadat, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So this verse over here, which I didn't translate, um, which I can do quickly if anyone wants. Does anyone want me to translate it uh, in written, or is it good enough in English just to say it verbally? Let me know in the chat box. Verbally is good enough. All right, verbally, okay. Good, so I'll do it verbally. Okay, so uh, let me just read it. <coughs> God said to Adam, this is Adam uh, in the Garden of Eden, God said to him, from all the fruits of the, uh, from all the fruit trees of the garden you can eat, but from the eight hadat, from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you may not eat. Now, note that the tree is called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What is the difference between good and evil and right and wrong? It said that Adam was created with a sense of right and wrong, but not with a sense of good and evil, and he he sinned, the one, one of the explanations of what his sin was, was that he absorbed the idea of good by eating from this fruit. He absorbed the idea of good and evil rather than simply right and wrong. What's the difference between them? Who could give a suggestion as to what the difference is between good and evil on the one hand and right and wrong, or let's, let's put it more precisely, true and false on the other. There's good and evil on the one hand, and true and false on the other. He knew what was true and what was false. And we know that he knew what was true and what was false, because he was able to give the proper name to everything. The angels were given the task of naming all the all, all, all aspects of creation, all the animals and the birds and so on and so forth, the flowers and the plants, giving them a name, and they did not know how to do it. Only Adam knew how to give a name. In other words, he knew how the, out, the, the, the being of something and what it is called should match. That's called truth. Truth is when the, when the, when the name, what you say about it, matches what it is. So he knew what was true and what was false. True and false he knew. True is what matches when the name, when what you say about it matches what it is. That's truth. And false is when it's, uh, falsehood is when it doesn't match. But what then is the difference between true and false on the one hand and good and evil on the other? So Eric says, right and wrong is neutral. Good and evil is subject to personal opinion and desires. That's exactly right. That is exactly the, the difference. The difference is that good and evil is a, is a value judgment. It's a value judgment. It's something that is not an objective reality. It's a subjective reality. So God was telling him from the tree of knowledge of subjective reality, of subjective judgments, that you may not that you may not partake of. Why not? Because it clouds the awareness of truth and falsehood. As soon as we mix in our own ideas our own selves, our own opinions, as Eric mentioned, our own desires, that changes our relationship to true and false. Okay. I'm going to bring this all together, don't worry. 
We're now going to go uh, down to uh, the next quote. <coughs> Everyone sees okay? We're going to do this one now. Okay. <coughs> so now the story continues, and the story says as follows. The, the, the serpent said to the woman, now the serpent is a symbol. It's a symbol of evil. It's a symbol of what is sometimes called the Yetzirah, the inclination to self-destruction, the self-destructive impulse that all of us are born with. We all have that. We all have the self-destructive impulse um, to a greater or a lesser extent. And that is really, we all have the self-destructive impulse because of what happened at the sin of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. At that time, it was something outside of themselves. It wasn't inside of Adam and Eve, but it was outside of them. And they brought it in, as we'll see, as we'll see shortly. So, the serpent, this aspect of evil, says to Eve, um, you will not die if you touch the tree or if you eat from its fruits, because God knows that on the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. Very important phrase, your eyes will be opened. And then you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Not right, not true and false, but good and evil. Continues and says, Vatere Haisha, the woman saw that she saw that the tree was good to eat and it was desirable to the eye. Tavahu Leinayim, it was desirable to the eye. So she took from its fruit and she ate and she gave to her husband to eat and they both ate. And then it says, their eyes opened up. And then they knew that they were, they were naked. Prior to this, I actually didn't quote this verse, which I meant to do. Um, prior to this, it says that Adam and Eve were, were in the Garden of Eden and they were, they were naked they did not have any shame. They didn't have any shame about the fact that they were naked. Now it says their eyes were opened and they knew that they were naked. This concept of busha, of shame, is very critical in understanding what is going on in this whole story, and we'll get to it again in a minute as soon as we do the next verse. God, the next uh, quote. God then says to them, Who told you that you were naked? Not how did you know, but who told you? You were naked. Who told you you were naked? Did you partake of the tree which I told you not to partake of? And then Adam says, the woman that you created for me, that you, that you gave to me, she gave me from the tree and I ate it. And then God says to the woman, why did you do that? What did you do? And she says, the serpent beguiled me. He convinced me to, uh, to eat and I ate. Notice the pattern of blame. Adam blames Eve, Eve blames the serpent, and so on and so forth. This is also a consequence of, one of, the, of what we're going to be talking about. So, let's just summarize where we are now. We spoke about the world of Tohu that broke apart, that shattered, and this world of Tohu came from the light of the eyes, so to speak, of Adam Kadmon. There's no eyes up there. It's just analogous to um, the concept of eyes, as we're going to explain. So the light of the eyes um, created the world of Tohu, and that's what uh, shattered. There is a concept called uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and it's a tree of knowledge of good and evil, but not of true and false. God tells them, do not partake of the knowledge of good and evil. 
even though one would think that to know good and evil might be a good thing after it says after all it says that uh, the snake says to or the serpent says to to Eve to Chava you will know good and evil like God knows it so what what could be wrong with that but he tells us no you cannot partake of the knowledge of good and evil but she sees that the fruits are good and um, they partake of the fruits and then they know that they are naked before that they didn't know they were naked and there was no shame involved Afterwards, they do know that they are naked, and God asks them, how do you know? Who told you? Who told you? Now, let's just focus on this for a minute. <clears throat> Before, when Adam and Eve were naked, it says, Lo boshashu. they were not ashamed. They had no shame. Shame was not a concept before the sin of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But there is a difference between the concept of shame and the concept of guilt. Now, naked could mean, Glory asks, what, is, uh, what does naked mean? Naked could mean, like in the literal sense, uh, no clothing. It could also mean in the sense that what, what does clothing do? Clothing, at the same time, it reveals, especially uh, <laughs> some of the clothing today, reveals quite a lot. But uh, at the same time, it reveals, it's supposed to hide, it's supposed to conceal what's in it. In other words, the clothes that you represent, you know, they say the, uh, the expression in English, I think, clothes make the man. Well, <clears throat> of course, that's not really true. But, um, but uh, in the sense that, that's our interface with the world. That's how we present ourselves. We present yourselves, um, let's say, if you work in a factory with a blue collar, you're called a blue collar worker um, because you wear uh, coveralls, overalls, whatever you want to call them, right? You wear uh, a tie and a suit, then you're a, um, uh, some kind of executive. You work in the executive uh, branch of the um, <clears throat> Of, of a company or whatever, right? So like suit and, uh, you know, clothing and to a certain extent is the way we present ourselves as to what we are. Incorrectly, of course, and that's one of the concepts of what Purim, the festival of Purim is all about, why people dress up and change their clothing and, and, um, and dress up as all kinds of um, different um, from what they are. <clears throat> In any event, uh, they lacked their sense of hidingness. That's what they lacked, Galen. They lacked hiding. Uh, in fact, uh, it says that immediately after the sin, uh, Adam went to hide. He went to hide amongst the trees of the garden. Hide from who? Well, can you hide from God? Uh, not really. And uh, God calls him out and says, where are you? Not because he didn't know where he was, but to ask him the question, well, where are you holding? In other words, where, where, where are you at now? Not where are you geographically. What is motivating? Where are you? What, what, what are you all about? What is your uh, driving force? Where are you? So clothing is the concept of, of hiddenness, of hiding. Now, uh, yes, since they didn't have no the concept of good and evil, they could act as they were. There was no barrier. There was truth and falsehood. They knew what truth was, and they acted truthfully, except that partaking of this uh, fruit was what gave them the knowledge of good and evil. And now good and evil means they don't act as they are anymore exactly. They're now connected with the concept of clothing. They are now, um, so to speak, wearing clothing. Now, let me just explain the difference now between shame and another concept related but different called guilt. What's the difference between shame and guilt? So, shame is what a person feels or what a person could feel in re relationship to the way he thinks other people think about, th uh, about things. He's ashamed of himself because he looks at himself through the eyes of others. He looks at himself through the eyes of others. That's the whole concept of shame. There's actually 
um, a, um, and there's, uh, there's a very interesting work uh, which discusses, discusses uh, two types of cultures. One is called the shame culture and one is called the guilt culture. But right? shame culture are those cultures where what other people think of you is of primary, primary importance. Now, this happens to be the culture of, for example, Japan. And also Arab culture. Arabic culture is always um, very, very tightly bound up with the concept of shame, what other people think of you, and therefore with honor. Very important idea that certain cultures are honor-bound, honor-based cultures. You probably know the Japanese, if a person uh, screws up really badly or whatever, he will kill himself, uh, Harakiri, because of... Um, uh, because of the shame and the inability to be able to to live with the way he now thinks that other people are going to see him because of the shame that he has in not uh, sticking to the mores and the moral uh, requirements of his society. But guilt is a different thing. Guilt is an internal moral compass. Guilt is not what other people think of you, but it's the knowledge of right and wrong, true and false. Shame is a knowledge of good and evil. One feels evil in the eyes of others because of certain actions that one did, whereas guilt has much more to do with true and false, right and wrong, true and false. So, what happened prior to, um, uh, to, to the sin was that Adam and Eve had a knowledge, an intimate knowledge, essentially, of right and wrong, true and false. They had no knowledge of this idea of, of, uh, of good and evil. After the sin because they now have knowledge of good and evil, which is, a, uh, which is a judgment, a subjective judgment, as opposed to the objectiveness of true and false, they now feel the idea of shame. Prior to the sin, no shame. After the sin, they do feel shame. The shame is not because of an internal error, so to speak, an internal mistake, but because they now start to look at themselves through the eyes of others. That is why immediately afterwards they blame, they start blaming each other. Adam blames Eve, and Eve blames the, the serpent, and so it goes, it's always other-oriented. Other people did this to me. It wasn't my own internal moral compass, when a person knows that he did wrong and it's, he has an internal moral compass, then he's able to say, I did the wrong thing and it is my fault. But when we're talking about a, a, a shame game or a blame game, then automatically the locus of responsibility is somewhere else. I was just acted upon by others. And that's what one finds in, so to speak, these, uh, these, um, these shame cultures, that that's how they keep people, in, keep people in control, or rather control them, through the concept of shame, through the concept of glory, through the concept of honor. You know, the, uh, the concept amongst Arabic societies of honor killings, I'm sure you've heard of them. When a girl makes eyes at a boy, even makes eyes, or, or talks to a boy without having a male escort from her family over there, she talks to a boy who's not part of the family, uh, they might simply put her to death because of honor. It's called an honor killing. I'm sure you've heard of them. <clears throat> In any event, we can now understand a little bit more about what the whole concept of the shattering of the vessels of Tohu was concerned, uh, was all about. We said that the world of Tohu was the light that came out of the eyes. In other words, it's a visual world. 
It's not a world of the internal compass, which is an ordeal world where we hear the voice of right and wrong, true and false, but we have a visual judgment. It's a visual concept where things are seen, but seen not as they are, but seen through the light, through the eyes of others. In fact, seeing altogether, <coughs> excuse me, seeing altogether has to do with reflection. When the light bounces off an object and it comes back, the light, the, the rays of light, the waves of, um, um, of light come back to our eyes, that's when, we, that's when we see things and it hits on the retina, etc., etc. So seeing is essentially a, uh, an interactive thing with what's outside of ourselves. We see things that are outside of ourselves. And therefore the tikkun, the rectification of this whole concept of the breaking of the vessels of tohu is to rectify this idea of seeing, this idea of other centeredness, uh, other centeredness, in order to um, uh, to to understand what is right and wrong. Right and wrong becomes not right and wrong, but again, good and evil value judgments. How do we make our value judgments based on what other people think, based on what our society thinks, based on what um, uh, uh, the the um, um, the local mores and 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 uh, and values are? So thinking about good and evil and sort of uh, imbibing, absorbing that whole concept of good and evil, that's what really needs the tikkun. The tikkun is, so to speak, to close one's eyes, which, why, which is why part of the tikkun is when one says Shema Israel, the prayer talking about the unity of God rather than the multiplicity of existence, when you say the prayer of the unity of God, you close your eyes and cover your eyes. Why close and cover the eyes? Because that's the rectification of the breaking of the vessels from the light of the eyes. The breaking of the vessels of seeing things, it's the seeing the visual culture that has to be put to sleep for a second. And that's why we say, Shema Israel, hear Israel, hear. Hear the voice of God not necessarily see things. As everybody probably knows, uh, um, icons of one sort or another, uh, icons and, and visual symbols are not part of Jewish religious culture at all. Um, there are no statues, there's no physical representations, and in fact, making uh, idolatry it's just that, making physical things out of spiritual concepts. So even symbols are, um, are sometimes questionable in certain contexts. So we have to cut out, therefore, or, or block off, let's put it that way, block off the visual way of looking at things. In other words, the group think about good and evil, and focus on the truth that we hear. Focus on the idea of um, true and false. Now, <clears throat> one finds very often in um, people who are having mental issues, um, I don't want to say mental illness necessarily, but uh, certainly in mental illness as well, it very often has, it's precipitated by a vision of the self from through the eyes of others, through the eyes of another person. <clears throat> Instead of looking at, for instance, if a person, um, um, an event happens, 
So then after an event happens, there's an interpretation of the event, you interpret it a certain way, and then one gets certain emotional responses. The emotional responses might be completely out of whack with the actual event, simply because the interpretation is such that um, the emotion aroused is uh, not commensurate with the, uh, with the event that happened. An event, that can, an event can happen to two, the same event can happen to two different people, and one person looks at it in one way completely differently from the way another person uh, um, experiences that event. And what happens very often in, men, in, in, in the beginning of mental, mental illness, or at least with psychological difficulties, is that the interpretation is based not on reality, on true and false. It's an interpretation which is based on all kinds of um, things like um, uh, we would describe good and evil. In other words, very much society-based, very much other what other people think of me now that this particular thing happened very negative um, way of looking at things, very unproductive way of looking at things. In any event, we could therefore understand that the, the, uh, the breaking of the world of Tohu, which was done with the intention of rebuilding it, that rebuilding, our sages say, the Kabbalists, the sages of the Kabbalah say that rebuilding has to come from the light of the ears, so to speak, and the light of the mouth of Adam Kadmon. In other words, the rectification comes about through listening and through speaking. Speaking what? Speaking truth. Not speaking falsehood. Listening, listening to the voice of God, listening to um, the voice of reason, listening to um, the listening essentially to the sound of the giving of the Torah, which was called, called Gadol Velo Yasaf, a great voice which never ended. In other words, when God spoke the words of the Ten Commandments, that was a, that was speech that never ended. It's, it's, it's echoes are still heard now. Now, if you sit and you meditate and you listen, you're going to hear the actual uh, words of uh, no. But it means that it was absorbed within creation and can be heard um, in, um, in a conceptual sense. It can be heard. So that really is the rectification, therefore, of the world of Tohu. It begins with Shema Yisrael, hear that God is one. Hear the oneness of God. Hear and then hear also means understand. So, correct understanding, which means understanding what is true and what is false, without the value judgments, is really the rectification of the world of Tohu. Okay, so that's about what I wanted to say. Are there any questions?